We can no longer go into communities and parachute in, asking um, communities to do a certain thing, to fight against industry, to fight against extraction, to fight against whatever, and then just leave that community. We have to make sure that communities are in a better place than they were when we started this work. Hello and welcome to episode four, season two of the RAN Wrap Up, Rainforest Action Network's look at the good, the bad, and the ugly in news from around the world affecting the climate and all those that depend on it. As always, we are taking a look this week at the issues that will ultimately affect all of us, what we can do about it, and what we are doing about it here at the Rainforest Action Network. Last episode, we talked with Mary, RAN's energy finance campaigner who helped spearhead our fight against the insurance industry. And if you're wondering, why, why are you targeting insurance companies? Uh, do I have an interview for you? You can check that out, it's, it's the one with Mary. Anyway, this week we have this really great interview uh, with Rochetto Zan, an amazing activist from Louisiana. It's so good that I'm breaking it into two parts so you can kind of savor it. Uh, this episode, we're talking about her organization, The Vessel Project of Louisiana, we're talking about Biden and pausing the LNG projects in the Gulf South and what that means. We're talking about the beauty of mutual aid and a whole lot more. But we can't just jump into an interview without giving you an action to take. Procter & Gamble makes billions of dollars partnering with one of the most destructive companies in the world, Royal Golden Eagle or RGE. They're responsible for community land theft and massive deforestation. So we need you to tell P&G to walk away from their messy relationship with Royal Golden Eagle for the good of our planet. Follow the link in the show notes down below, fill out a couple of things, click a couple buttons or two and you're done. It'll take you about 30 seconds of your time. Honestly, like, like you, you could have literally done it by now and been back here. That's how quick it takes. So I'm just saying, you, you should just go do it. 12 seconds later. And there you go. See how easy that was? Thanks for taking action. Okay, let's jump into our chat with Rochetta Ozan. Thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and can you tell us about the Vessel Project of Louisiana? Yes, of course. My name is Rochetta Ozan. I am a mom of six living in southwest Louisiana um, near a place called Lake Charles, but I live in a town called Sulphur. I am the founder, director, and CEO of the Vessel Project of Louisiana. The Vessel Project is a small mutual aid emergency assistance a disaster recovery environmental justice organization who um, we help those that are most vulnerable in our community. Our community is an environmental justice community in Southwest Louisiana that is surrounded by um, fossil fuel extractive industries, a bunch of petrochemical facilities, LNG, which is liquefied natural gas facilities, and other type of fossil fuel industries. So our community is prone to several different types of climate-induced disasters, such as hurricanes, floods, wildfires, droughts, uh, winter storms. And so what we do with the Vessel Project we help the community members who are impacted by those climate-induced disasters. We help them to get back on their feet. But then we also educate those community members on what is causing those climate-induced disasters to be so frequent, to be so record-breaking, you know, these monstrous um, type of disasters that are coming through that have never been seen before that are coming so rapidly now in the last few years. We educate the community on those and also on the different projects that are currently here that are emitting greenhouse gases and the ones that are proposed to come here. And in doing that and, and educating people, um, we also attend hearings for these type of projects. We attend local city council meetings, we attend state meetings, and we also uh, uh, do lobbying on the Hill in D.C. 
well, it sounds like you're keeping <laughs> keeping busy. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, can you, um, I mean, you listed a bunch of the issues that uh, the Gulf Coast is facing. Um, are, are there some that stand out more than others to you that feel um, really important and that the Vessel Project or you, you independently really focus on? Yes. So our main focus is the build out of fossil fuel industry that is targeted for the Gulf Coast. The Gulf Coast has been um, made a sacrifice zone for oil and gas. And we're here to say that enough is enough. Our communities are struggling. Very, They have very low resources, um, low income uh, communities, black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color communities who are being overburdened by fossil fuel extractive industries. And what is uh, coming or proposed to come to our communities right now is these LNG or liquefied natural gas projects, which really are just methane polluting industries that are causing more harm to the communities. These type of facilities are producing methane and other harmful gases, which cause things like asthma, bronchitis, other respiratory issues, different types of skin conditions. We know that Louisiana uh, women have higher chances of having babies with low birth weights. You know, you may think, well, there's asthma here, there's cancer here, but the numbers in Louisiana are astronomical, and those numbers are even higher in communities that are surrounded by these industries. If people's health is at risk, they can't function in any other part of their lives. So we're trying to ensure that more industry doesn't come here. We're trying to highlight the industry that's already here. We are championing for these communities to get more resources and more funding to provide the things that people need. Clean drinking water, clean air, a safe community that has grocery stores with access to fresh produce, those are some of the basic things that people need here. But also, this is a community that has been hit with several natural disasters. We were hit by two major hurricanes, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta, both in 2020, followed by a massive winter storm, Winter Storm Uri, in the winter of 2021, and also a major flood that happened in the spring of 2021. This community is still recovering. We have people who still have blue tarps on their roofs. So in order to get people to an understanding of what is contributing to this climate crisis that we're in, we have to make people whole, make sure that they have a safe place to stay, clean drinking water, clean air, make sure they have food, make sure that their children are okay, and then we educate them on what's happening so that we can fight against that build out. I guess we've had a little bit of news recently, right? Uh, you know, Biden, you know, put a pause on, on LNG. Do we see this as like a good step forward or is this a way to appease environmental voters in an election year or is it a little bit of both because, but maybe who cares because it's pausing the LNG problem or, or is he just kind of punting it down the road a little? This is a both and all, right? Um, we felt like there needed to be a major move made by the Biden administration if he wanted young people to vote and if he wanted people who are living in these environmental justice communities to vote uh, in favor of him becoming the president again. So we feel like this was that major move. We feel like when President Biden and the Department of Energy made the decision to pause the permitting of new proposed liquefied natural gas projects, that this was a major step. The president was basically saying, oil and gas industry, we're coming after you. They saw that. They know that it's major because we've seen many of those companies challenge this decision. We even saw that the Senate hosted a hearing uh, about the decision. We know that major companies are trying to have, um, you know, take this decision to court because they feel like it is threatening 
um, those industries coming into our community. Well, as community members, we feel like this was a big move, but we feel like it's not enough because we here in Southwest Louisiana already have LNG projects that are currently operating that are not impacted by this pause at all. There are LNG projects that are operating in Texas that are not impacted by this pause. In fact, any project that was already approved is unimpacted by this pause. So there is still a lot of work to be done. However, that does not take away from the fact that this was a major move. And what we're asking for now as frontline community people is that we be involved in the process of shaping this public interest determination framework. Yes, it can kind of feel like kicking the can down the road because no major decisions will be made until after the election. This is a temporary pause, but we feel like if we are a part of the conversation from the very beginning, if we are allowed to help shape this framework, to help change policy, to show that these projects are not in the interest of the public, because we are the public where these projects are located, and we know they're not in our best interest. We don't receive the jobs that come with these uh, projects. We don't receive any type of economic development in our communities. Our communities in Southwest Louisiana, some of them still look like they belong in a developing country. They don't look like they're a part of a state that is surrounded by a billion-dollar industry. As my colleague James Hyatt says all the time, the streets of Louisiana should be paved in gold with the amount of industry that's here. But that's just not true. So there's a lot of work to be done, and that pause was a step in the right direction. And it gives us room to really change policy, to be included, be involved, and to make sure that this will become bedrock legislation that says that these projects cannot be permitted if they are going to harm and kill people in the communities where they are located. To me, it feels like, you know, he he didn't pick LNG out of thin air, right? Like that was an, an issue that was in front of him. And that was, uh, it, in my opinion, like a testament to the work that you all are doing down there. So, you know, you, you talked a little bit about mutual aid, which personally, um, I think is something that doesn't get talked about enough, um, despite it being like, you know, a really beautiful way, I think communities show up for one another. Um, and I'm always, you know, I'm always really moved and touched by stories of mutual aid. Can you tell us a little bit about like just what is mutual aid for people that might not know that term? Um, and what does that look like um, in your community? So mutual aid is assistance that is provided by those in need, by those who have it. Right. So in my community, a lot of the initial funding and assistance for my organization, The Vessel Project, came from crowdsourcing. People will reach out to The Vessel Project and say, hey, I need help paying my rent. And somebody local in the community would say, hey, I have that $800 to pay that person's rent. I will send it to you, a Vessel Project, and you can help that person out. And that's what mutual aid is. It's meeting a need with resources that you might have readily available to meet the need. And we've been very successful with providing mutual aid because one thing we have to realize is that if we're going to talk about the fact that where these these build outs are happening with um, fossil fuel extractive industries, where the pipelines are going, where the new LNG projects are going, where carbon capture is being proposed. These are all, again, low income, black, indigenous people of color communities that have very little resources. Well, if these communities continue to stay in a state of very low resources, very little income, then they're always going to be appealing to some type of industry, right? Some type of harmful industry that's going to say, we, we can go in this community because they need economic development, because they need workforce development. But if we build those communities up from the inside, from the bottom up, and provide community members with the things that they need, then those industries can't check a box off the list to say that that's, that's community is in need, right? So that is what we're trying to do with mutual aid here 
And with this assistance program that we offer, um, it is barrier free, red tape free. Really, people contact us and say they need assistance with whatever it is they need assistance with utilities, rental assistance, food. We assist them. And then we don't just assist them one time and push them to the side. We stay in contact with that person, asking them questions like, what can help you get in a position to where you won't need this help again in the future? Some people need help with things like a better job or they need a car or they need child care assistance. So then we either help them help to provide them with the tools to get the, that type of assistance or we connect them with other programs in the state or on a, a more federal level or within our coalitions to help them get that assistance that they need. These people then, again, they become advocates and proponents for their communities to say that I want to build my community up. I want to be a better person in my community. I want to be able to afford to live here. I want to help my neighbors. And that is where that mutual part comes in. A lot of the people that we help are the same people who turn around and help someone else. They come, they turn around and they volunteer at the community events that we host. They attend hearings. They come and march with us in D.C. They march with us in New York. I mean, they become a part of the family. And it that is really what community building looks like. We can no longer go into communities and parachute in, asking um, communities to do a certain thing, to fight against... Uh, industry to fight against extraction to fight against whatever and then just leave that community we have to make sure that communities are in a better place than they were when we started this work i think the 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 louisiana and new orleans has such a rich history of mutual aid you know going back to katrina and and, and beyond that right it's um it's inspiring to hear that it still flourishes and you do it in such a great way. It, it is it is just beautiful to hear about community, supporting communities and building your, your community up. It's something that really inspires me. So I appreciate the work. Okay, sorry for the interruption, but we do have to cut this into two, but check back next episode for the second part in two weeks. And of course, thanks again to Rochetta for all your incredible work and for your dedication to your community and fighting the issues, impacting them in such a major way. As always, if you'd like to get more involved in taking action or getting more information on these issues, head on over to our webpage at ran.org, that's R-A-N dot O-R-G, where you can join us in using people power to challenge business as usual. Why would you want to do that? Because we win.